an executive. It's worked out to be that kind of case. Well, and then the, the third type of government would be a polity for Aristotle. A polity is where everybody rules. Now, for Aristotle, everybody would be a, a legitimate male wealthy people. That's who everybody was. So that's not everybody in the way we would think of it today. Um, but you know, at the time, 500 people in Athens, you know, the government, you know, essentially, would be like a democracy. Um, but actually, the democracy wouldn't be a polity because a polity is where those 500 people are intelligent, concerned, and trying to understand what's going on and do the best they can. In a deme, a democracy, you end up with idiots, basically. You know, that end up thinking. Weird things, and then what you know, you know, dumb stuff as a result, you know. And so, the problem with that, and, and remember, Jefferson, one of his concerns is if we're going to have a democracy or a republic, we need to have a good education because people that are going to be the voters are going to have to be smart enough to know the issues and decide good decisions, etc., right. So there was a limit there too, you know. That what they were thinking was rich plantation owners. Those are the people, not the wives. <laughs> the wives are not included in this at all. And remember, and not everybody's even a citizen, because you could actually own people, and people that are owned are not citizens. They're not part of the community. They're property, not members of the community. Um, well, the way. Thomas Hobbes interprets this, though, is perfectly in line with the monarchy, which is already a limited monarchy, thanks to uh, um, uh, John and the, uh, uh, the um, Carta, the Magna Carta, right? He gave up some of his authority in order to keep his head. Uh, you know, that's quite earlier, right? Um, and by the way, you can still go see that. They have it on display, the original, in a, um, it's near the, uh, um, the Stonehenge area. It's a, it's a big uh, cathedral near there. And there's a special uh, area uh, where it's housed, and you can go and see it. I think it's back now, because there was a guy that attacked it with a hammer not too long ago. He didn't actually get to it, but he broke the glass on something. But, you know, that's happens. In any case, um, for Hobbes, this social contract is where we give up rights to have someone in charge. And we give up our rights to the monarch. And the monarch then becomes one with the community. So this is a good monarch. This is not, you know, the tyrant. This isn't a crazy guy. This is instead, well, this is King Charles II, who I taught. <laughs> so he's, you know, a good, you know, smart king, you know, and he'll he'll make good choices, says Thomas Hobbes. So the contract, and, and I guess the main thing I want to bring up is that this social contract is theoretical. I mean, you were born, I'm assuming, a citizen of this country. Um, but it took you, what, 18 years before you were officially eligible to like vote and shoot a gun and you know other important things you know that you need to be old enough for. 15 years to you pay taxes. You get the idea, right? You know, this is something that, you know, it's, it's, you know, everybody's a member, even though you never voted and said, wait a minute, I don't agree to any of this stuff, you know? I didn't uh, ask for DNA. You didn't? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that didn't even get membership. They just lost the land to people that claimed that they did have membership. One of uh, a Willie... Hensley's chapters, if, if you read uh, his book, 50 Miles from Tomorrow, I'm familiar with Willie, Willie, Willie Hensley? 
Um, this one, I'm going to do Willie Hensley, and I want, um, oh, does he have more than, obituary, no, don't tell me that, no way, we'll all know when he dies, that's not going to happen, 50 miles from tomorrow, um, yeah, because he was from, um, the, or the area where he lived was only 50 miles from the international date line. It was a Uh, it begins with a K. Kotsugu. Kotsugu. That's where I'm from. That's so cool. Well, so he's. It's probably my cousin. <laughs> yeah. So you should read. You <laughs> should read this book. But <laughs> uh, he also is a professor here. So right. Oh, he was. Still, you think? I've, I've, I've gone to some of his lectures. So he, he's here. Um, and we even had him in our, our book group. He came and helped discuss this book when our book group did it. But um, he lived, you know, because his village, the people move around. And so they um, would go to their fish camp during the summer. And the one summer, they all went to fish camp, and when they, the end of the season, they packed up and they came back home and discovered that their home had been sold and bought, and the whole town had been taken over by uh, um, a government that they had nothing to do with, because they weren't citizens, they weren't, you know, authorized ownership, or, you know, so their home was no longer their home. It was gone. Someone else took it. So if you can't believe, that's messed up. There's the book. It's, I'm sure you can get 50 copies over in the library because um, he's a homegrown, important person. Was this um, his, the story like his home got taken? Yes. He was a kid. But yeah, his, his parents, grandparents' home so was their home like forever. And mm -hmm. when they came back, it was no longer theirs. And it wasn't just theirs, it was the whole village. Wait, 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 did this happen during Pearl Harbor time? No, much earlier. Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of stories that people don't remember. Never mind. No, I highly recommend this book if you're uh, wanting to get a, a, a grasp of at least some of Alaska history. He was also, um, he went to a high school in Tennessee. He graduated from there and went to college and got a law degree and became one of the first natives, if not the first native, to get into the legislature. Um, he was involved in the land uh, um, uh, the distribution, etc., cetera, uh, and, the, and the agreements and stuff. Very, very important person in that. Um, so, one of my friends ran against him and lost to him in that uh, election. But he's, he's terrific. When did I bring him up? I forget. Uh, who is a member of the contract? And that's, that's still an issue. We're still arguing over that. So if you think about social contract and how it's evolved, Plus, the contract gives people rights. So if you're trying to figure out, well, where's our natural rights? Remember, in the state of nature, everybody has a right to everything and nothing, basically. Uh, uh, but so when we form a contract, now what we might have, depending on the contract, are rights. And you know, there, there are a lot of folks that argue that these rights, and, and we, we have the declaration, that talks about this, right? Uh, that says, all men, whoever the heck those are, are created equal, and all of us have rights that are inalienable or unalienable? Inalienable. Because they argued over that. Weren't sure which it would, would be, as far as I understand. Is how to spell it and everything. It's inalienable because they cannot be taken away, nothing may not be taken away. Okay, because well, here's, here's an interesting issue. You 
kill somebody, all your rights are gone. I mean, yeah, but also black men are men, and apparently we weren't committed equal black men, so well, it's not the only contradiction in the Constitution. Slaves, slaves were not men. Well, well they were men, but they were slaves, so they weren't part members of the contract. Yeah. What about Native Americans? They didn't really have a lot of rights either. Right. Well, they weren't part of the contract either. Who's a member of the contract? What about women? Women weren't a member of the contract <laughs> until... property <laughs> So, you were confused. So, rich white so they, men. Yeah, rich, yeah. rich white men. Don't look at me! She looked at me like I'm the one. Not rich. Not rich. I Which don't one believe in being a snow was there. I don't know because none of my folks kept track of any of that. Yeah. But you get the idea, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, anybody could be a slave, as we will see. Who? It could be because of the, 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 yeah, the etymology of the word, yeah. Um, schiava, I don't know, that's Italian, maybe it's Latin too, but um, yeah, I mean, all kinds of folks were slaves. Um, and still are, by the way, right? Um, and, and one of the reasons I think uh, that they say we now have wage slaves, you've heard that expression? Yeah. No? yeah. Was because actually it was cheaper. If you owned a person, you had to house them, feed them, take care of them, et cetera, et cetera. Well, up depending on your own interests, right? Um, but if you didn't own them and you just paid them a wage, you could be as cheap as Walmart, basically. So, so it actually turned out to be good economic policy to do away with slavery, because now you could get them to work for a lot less. That's tragic. It's not my fault. I'm just the bearer of bad news. Well, that's what I am. But so, so back to, to Hobbes and how this works out. Um, Hobbes ends up being a supporter of the monarch. Because if you don't have one individual who's the chief executive that will enforce the rules, there will be arguments between the chieftains underneath it that will cause war or or the next group will have war. In other words, if you're going to get out of having war, period, and that was Thomas Hobbes' biggest concern was danger, peril. He wanted to be safe because he was always fleeing because of all the dangers that he was facing during his lifetime. So he wanted to go to other places. Um, back to the body, though. Um, this is also when we have the development of medicine. And one of the individuals uh, that I think is really neat is Dr. Theodore Mayern. His name got changed depending on where he lived. He was originally from Switzerland, Geneva, Huguenot, which were um, Protestants. He ended up becoming the doctor for the King of France. And when the King of France died, not necessarily his fault, he ended up quickly leaving and heading to England, where he became the doctor for the King of England. So he was like you know, the, the chief doctor among a lot of different individuals. And what's odd about him is he believed in physical chemical as being important to your health. So remember, you know, in the different uh, monastic orders, starving the body is good for the soul. You know, the, the body is the last thing you want to take care of. Of course, there are going to be uh, secular priests. That sounds funny, doesn't it? But secular priests were the original use of secular because you had the, the monastic orders who were all focused on eternity, but you had some priests 
who were primarily concerned with serving the people. And so those were called secular. Because uh, remember, secular is now, and second, you know, at this moment, right? Instead of eternal, eternity. So secular uh, were the priests who were focused on the actual parish, taking care of the parish ministry. Um, they do end up overlapping. I remember my uh, teachers in high school who were Augustinians, were monks.